This is Pastor Curry, pastor of the East Zion Fair Baptist Church, Wilmington's most exciting church, the church that love ya and ain't a thing you can do about it. Listen, today on Coffee with Curry, we have the legendary brother Jay Street. He is a county councilman, and I'm very grateful to God that I have him as a friend, fraternity brother, and a true confidant. He is going to be with us today, and I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have as he continues the struggle of working for those who are a part of the human race. Listen, call somebody real quickly. Tell them Coffee with Curry is on, and let's get after it. J.P. Street was raised in Wilmington, Delaware, the son of Henry and Dorothy Porter Street. He attended Wilmington High School and later the University of Delaware. Street's family was active in the NAACP and community affairs generally throughout the 1950s and 60s, a time sometimes referred to as the Civil Rights Era. So thus did Street's commitment to civil rights develop, influenced by his family's involvement and dedication the fact of the matter is my mother was a social worker. She was also an active member of the NAACP, and she was the first African-American president of then the Wilmington Home School Community Council. So the adage that the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree is applicable with me. Mr. Street served as executive director of the Parent Educational Resource Center from 1974 until 1981, working to prepare parents and students for the implementation of court-ordered school desegregation. During this time, he became a well-established student advocate, representing students and parents in suspension, expulsion, and special education hearings. The one word that um, I would use to kind of uh, describe him is loyal. He's loyal to his family, he's loyal to his community, he's loyal to his own, uh, his own moral code of conduct, and he's loyal to the cause of advocating for equity in education. He gave me uh, the belief that people could advocate for students in a public education system, because there's not a lot of people doing it. You know? So to have him as an example and a leader in that arena, I think it really impacted me. We fought vigorously for children throughout the uh, desegregation era. We sued the Red Clay School District twice and prevailed. In 2004, Street was elected to Newcastle County Council, representing the 10th District. And he continues in that position today. Thankfully, though, he has continued his advocacy work on behalf of children. He is one of a kind, he is like no other, and he is really uh, one of the, the last uh, in, in that legacy uh, of people that, are, that continue to be on the battle lines every day. Jay is like one of those, those leaders that you really don't consider, even though he's in office, to be a politician. You consider him more of a statesman and just a community leader. Everybody respects and loves Jay Street. In 2007, he worked very closely with Wilmington City Council and the mayor as the city and five parents successfully sued the Christina School District to ensure that city schools were not closed. In December 2014, he supported the ACLU of Delaware and the Community Legal Aid Society in their complaint with the United States Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, alleging resegregation in charter schools. J Street's life is a template for successful community involvement. He serves as executive director of Hilltop Lutheran Neighborhood Center, the center's budget has increased from $70,000 to its current $1.7 million, with $1 million in jobs created. At the end of the day, we can point to the record, and we take children numerically and statistically destined for failure. 60 to 70 percent of our children are on the honor roll each and every year. Most important, importantly to me, we see them graduate from high school and now haven't been there over 35 years. Um, we're seeing kids graduate from college each and every year. Jay Street has been married to his wife, Bealey, for over 40 years, and they have two sons, Jay Jr. and Jason. The newest Street generation includes one grandson, Jason Jr., and one granddaughter, Ray. They have large shoulders to stand on and big shoes to fill.
And we're back. As I indicated to you all, we have a pioneer from the city of Wilmington, a person who was uh, born and bred here in the city. And I'm just excited about this. I was joking with him during uh, the, our time of intermission. I was saying, you know, just like having Oprah on the show. And he was like, who who you calling Oprah? But your status, your your symbol is, is, is why I said that. But I just want to say welcome and thank you so much, uh, Councilman uh, uh, Street, for just taking the time to be with us today. And I know that you really don't like to come out and put on your church clothes, but I'm glad that you're here today. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. I don't like putting on a, what I call a monkey suit, but you know, it goes with the territory. You ask for a job, you gotta play the role, you gotta look the part. So that's what I do. Yeah, you're right. Let's, before we get started with uh, some of the political more questions, I've only, I, this is a time for people to get a chance to know J Street. J Street has done so much for so many people. And I know you're not really trying to get glory and seek that because you were born out of a family who always gave back to their community. But let's talk a little bit about that family. Let's, let's, let's hear a little bit about, you know, your, your upbringing and, and what were some of the influences on your life? Well, you know, I was blessed. I am blessed. The fact that born and raised here in the city of Wilmington, um, and I had two parents with government jobs. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have no more sense than to think we were rich. Um, my daddy got me, you're talking about a perfect childhood, anything I wanted, regardless of how ridiculous it was, my daddy got me. Mm. I was driving a new car to school and I was 16 years old. Wow. <laughs> it was his car, I had to take mom to work, pick her up, but when I got to school, it was my car. Mm. Um, so, you know, and, and not only the influence of my mother, who was a social worker um, and who was very active uh, in the community with the NAACP, with Shiloh Baptist Church, uh, with the Wilmington Homeschool Community Council. As a matter of fact, she was the first black president of the former Wilmington Homeschool Community Council. And Councilman Hollins last, we're not telling, but when I was a kid, I actually thought it was against the law, Mr. NAACP meeting. Oh, wow. Because vacations, special events, everything was planned around when the NAACP meeting was, mm -hmm. when the NAACP convention was. Wow. Uh, you know, I had an uncle who was a doctor. Uh, the Porter Center's named after him. If, if you look, J.P. Street, the middle name is Porter. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Wanda Porter was my uncle. And certainly he had an influence on all of us because he was a doctor. Right. Um, and my uncle Luther Porter was the was a math teacher at Howard High School, taught there for years. Um, and he was known basically as Mr. NAACP. Wow. Um, every grandchild that was born. The day that child was born, he went, went down to the NAACP office, brought a Golden Heritage membership. Wow. Um, he never missed a convention. The late Keith Booker, who uh, was president of the NAACP at the time, we had a major blizzard. Uh, Keith was working for the city. NAACP meeting was in, in the city building. Mm -hmm. Well, Keith canceled the meeting. He ain't called nobody. Uncle Luther's sitting up there, he lived in Bel Belvedere, he's sitting up there and refused to go. Security said the, the meeting's canceled, he said, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not leaving, until they had to get Keith on the phone for Keith to tell him the meeting was canceled, then wow. he left. Wow. Um, so there's a, a, a great family tradition of being involved in the whole issue of fairness and the whole issue of civil rights. Um, and. I'm going to tell you the same thing I said. I mean, I testified in, in the school funding litigation and made it crystal clear that I was the kind of child nobody would babysit. Oh, wow. And I can hear my father now, mom's going to NAACP, me, no, take him with you. Because if you don't take him with you and you come back, you might not recognize him. Mm. And so I'm going to NAACP meetings for punishment, supposed to be sitting over in the corner playing. Well, I'm in a church and I can remember being in the Y, I can remember being at uh, uh, Community Presbyterian where Reverend Moyer was, uh -huh. um, the pastor, and the adults 
discussing and making decisions about where they're going to sit in, mm -hmm. where they're going to demonstrate, who they're going to sue, and they're arguing. And sometimes they get to cursing in church. Mm. Now, wait a minute. I ain't playing no more. I'm, I'm watching this fight. And, you know, when, when you're around people as a child looking at the adults strategize, basically, I was in the strategy room mm -hmm. as a child, and <clears throat> some things never go away. They would argue, they would differ, but they would come out unified. And, of course, the primary voice of reason and the primary decision maker was a great Louis L. Redden. Mm. Um, so I had that experience, not that I was involved in anything, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that was part of my learning right, and, and upbringing and yeah. it was helpful. So when these young people now run out and we're going to have a demonstration, wait, whoa, 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 before you all start talking about hitting the bricks, mm -hmm. where's the bail bondsman? Right. Where's your security? Right. What lawyers are on standby? Right. Well, I learned that being in the strategy room. Right. And then um, coming forward, when I became the executive director of the Parent Educational Resource Center, um, and that was my first job coming out of school, and right after I started that job, because we went from, we were in the process, the state filed to go from one district to super district to four districts, um, we formed the coalition is to save, started out as coalition to save our schools, ended up being coalition to save our children, mm -hmm. to fight implementation of the four district plan. And so we had a coalition meeting and I was elected treasurer, but a few months or so after that, we had a meeting, before the meeting, mm. um, with Irving Morris, Hicks Anderson and, and <coughs> Judge Williams at the time, all, all of them gone, all of them I miss dearly, but part of my mentors and, 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 and training, called a meeting to meet was Hilltop. By that time I was at Hilltop and, and was the director. So I come in the meeting, what's up? Mm -hmm. And Judge Williams says, we've decided that you're gonna be the liaison between the coalition and the lawyers. You're going to be at council table with the lawyers, uh, helping make decisions and part of the strategy, et cetera. I said, Judge, why I got to do that? <laughs> I'm not no lawyer. Why, why do I have to do that? Right. And he said, well, we're planning for the future, and we see you as a major part of that future. All right. And Hicks jumped up and stood over top of me and said, shut the such and such up and mm. do what the such and such you're told. Mm. Um, and at that time, you know, the, the love and respect I had for Hicks, plus he was way bigger than me, all I could do was look up and say, yes, sir. But as a result of that, I'm at council table with Lou Redden, Irv Morris, Judge Williams, Lou Lucas. That's a training yeah. that most lawyers, young lawyers would love to have. More importantly, I'm in the strategy room with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that experience, and I give them credit, and for whatever reason, I've kind of tongue lashed lawyers recently, but why out of all the people in this town did they pick me, a lay person as opposed to a lawyer, and because they realized everybody else was either selfish, mm or all about making money. Right. And they saw, saw me, I guess, the one to be naive enough to take it on. And of course, now I've been involved for 46 years. Excellent. It's yeah. not excellent because it's past time for new players on our side. Right. And I'm excited about the young people who are in the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited about the Legislative Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. And I've got to do a better job now of making the bringing about the transition um, because it's past time. Right. Yeah, but you know, one of the, a couple of things that you said and I was very impressed with is that one, um, you had such a respect for your elders. 
and you were born and bred through this whole cycle of understanding um, that the NAACP mattered, one. Also, that when you're told to do something, even if you didn't want to do it, your level of respect caused you to go ahead and do it. Well, and, and not only that, it, it was personal because mm -hmm. I was not a model child. Okay. And the psychologists and the psychiatrists, they would say, well, he had identity <laughs> crisis. Yeah, I did. Oh. And um, as a result of that, I can hear my father saying now, you know, your problem is you want everybody to know you're black and you think the only thing you can do to impress somebody about you being black is act like a such and such fool. Well, mm -hmm. if you keep on you're going to fool around, you're going to go to jail. And I'm not going, I'm, I'm tired of fighting for you. I'm tired of fighting on you. And I'm to the point where you got to figure out that when you get to the point, the only opinion about you that matters is yours, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Until then, you're going to have some problems. Well, I did have some problems. You know, I'm putting on a speed and exhibition and doing this, that, and other. Got a whole lot of driving charges um, and ended up with a, a running charge. Um, I lost my license, was running to catch a bus. Cops stepped out of the alley, stop, I blow your head off. Me and my best friend at the time running. Well, no, you out of pistol range already, so we left. Got caught. Well, my parents got Judge Williams to represent me. Mm -hmm. Judge Williams says, Your Honor, because he was, even though he was a municipal court judge, he could practice law in family court. Mm -hmm. So he goes in and said, Your Honor, running is not a crime. According to the city ordinance, such and such and such and such. Running for years, city children, uh, when they see police, they flee. That's why this was put in. The ordinance is crystal clear. And the judge said, well, Judge Williams, the ordinance also states, and Judge Williams looked at the judge and said, lady, mm -hmm. don't tell me what the ordinance states because I wrote it when I was city solicitor. Mm. And see, when you, got, when you see a black man yeah. pushing his way around the courthouse like that, for you, oh, you can't do anything but respect him. Okay. And, you know, that power never went away, which is why I was one of many people that fought so hard to get that courthouse named after Judge Williams. And I'm glad you did that. I'm, in fact, I was going to talk about that, too. But when did you come to the point, and we get ready to go to a commercial break, but when did you come to a point when the identity crisis was over and you knew you were J Street? Actually, I was, when I was in 11th grade is when my father told me that. And actually, my dumb behind, it took me four years. Mm. And I didn't figure it out until I was a junior at the University of Delaware. I'm walking around campus with the biggest afro in town, people tight curling my hair and all that. And everything was red, green, and black. I got pictures of Huey, Huey Newton on the door. <laughs> you know, students would burn them up because I was at the University of Delaware. And I had a whole stack of them in the back. So every time they burn it or take it, I put it up. And then I got up one morning and then looked in the mirror, reflected on what my father said, said, this don't make no sense. Mm -hmm and did that and I ain't never looked back and um, from that day forward the only opinion about me that matters is mine okay and not for that I wouldn't be able to do what I've done for the past 46 years uh -huh. because when you do this work if you worry about criticism and what people think oh yeah you're gonna have difficulty but if you do what's in your heart and your mind and you think that's what's right and that's what you should do then you do it, and everybody else, I know we're in church, can go pound sand. Oh, yeah, amen. Well, you know, we're going to take a commercial break, but when we come back, I do want to talk about the whole Judge Williams uh, building, because at one point they wanted to name it something else, and there were several who said that ain't going to happen. Oh. But, so, so just give me a second. We'll be right back. I was a young guy when Hicks was around. I mostly remember him being up at Washington Street, standing in front of that building, because I went to high school with a lot of guys from, from Wilmington High. But I know Hicks was a guy that, he was a male role model, which was very helpful to have in a neighborhood of a lot of people who didn't have parents. And Hicks, you know, through even through his son's nominee now and his daughters have left a legacy of this area. So he engaged all the kids from West Center City so throughout the whole city of Wilmington, and he wanted to make their lives better. And he realized too that education is really the way you have to be able to do that. 
So we look to follow his lead. We have a nice little bust out front of Hicks. You know, he was always a stern man. He always had that stern look to him. That's okay. Sometimes you have to be stern. But inside his heart, he was always trying to take care of people. Uh, the Hicks Center is a um, valuable, valuable statement place in our community. It has been for years. I mean, prior to being Hicks Center, when it was West Center City Community Center, it's always, I mean, a program and not just for everything from the, the youth to the seniors, you know, from infants and, and, you know, everything. It's just always been very relevant to our community. Well, the William Hicks Center is um, the city's um, owned community center in the center of West Center City. Um, it's a place where the children have an opportunity and our seniors to go and um, do what you do at a community center and that's have fun. It's a whole barrage of activities. Um, and I would say some, for most kids, it's a home away from home. Uh, it's, it's truly, I mean, it's, it's a place in which I think truly culminates my, my father's spirit. He was a person who was always giving, especially for, for youth and for our seniors and just really pulling our community together. So that city being named in his honor was a great tribute. And I think it, it said a lot, I mean, for the work that he did for our, our city, even for our nation with the Title I dollars program, bringing that here to our, our city and state, it really meant a lot just to, to recognize him and, and that city, I mean, and that, that center and that part of the community that really had a, a great need at that time. It, it, it just hallmarked a, a great period in, in our lives where our, our city was really invested in, in our future and he really spoke for the community. Well, Hicks Anderson uh, Community Center is the city's only community center. It's, uh, gosh, it's been open for decades and decades. And to me, it's, um, it's most important for what, it, what goes on there, but it's also important for what it symbolizes. And over the years, it's sad to say, but Hicks has just declined. Its condition has declined and declined. And people have always talked about, they've asked whether it was worth um, tearing it down or trying to rehabilitate the building. And so frankly, nothing has been done. On top of that, uh, Hicks had a security gate when you walked right in that gave you the impression that you're going into a prison. It was such a, it was such a daunting, uh, uh, edifice here. I mean, you had to go through, you had to go through the same kind of a check that you would if you're going into a, you know, a corrections facility. And so we tore it all out, uh, the front of the building, which was all concrete with little slats of glass. We just opened all up and it's about 15 or 16 feet of glass. We want people to walk in there feel welcome. And so we decided to rehab the building. We we did, we did a beautiful job of restoring it, but as I said, we made design features that suggested to people that this was a safe place, that it wasn't the kind of place that everybody had to be thinking about violence that you would do intuitively when you walked into a place that had this big security desk. Oh, I'm excited about the renovations. Um, just like any uh, revitalization, freshening up, fresh paint, a new look, um, mostly, it demonstrates to the community that we, the city, care about them um, and we're willing to invest that they have a place that they could come and um, play, come and learn, and come and be community. It's a breath of fresh air for, uh, for the citizens. Some, some, uh, some of the people in this community have been here since this building was built. They saw the renovations, they were able to watch, and I think, uh, it does, it does a great, it's, it's a real boost for the community. It's a refuge for our young people. It's a, a safe haven for our seniors. It's, it's a place for families to come and get resources. Um, it's a place they can be healthy. I mean, we have this, we have a pool, um, the physical gym. It, it just provides a lot of the um, amenities that a community needs to grow and thrive. Personally, I love it. You couldn't have did a better thing. I, I, I love it because once you come in the center and the door, you look like you come in a cage. But now you come to open space like it's welcoming everybody. Before it looked like you wasn't welcome. But now you welcome everybody. So excellent, excellent. We just put six sewing machines downstairs to have young people sew. Novel idea, you know what I mean? But boys and girls want to sew. But that we have that, we have the gymnasium is open, the, the kitchen, we're gonna start cooking food, preparing food, teaching young people how to cook. Uh, Bob Cannon starting a GED program here for individuals. 
We have a few other programs that we're bringing in. The goal would be during the day to offer services for the adults in the neighborhood, job training, job searching, skills to be able to help them benefit themselves. From three to eight, it's for the young people to be able to come you know, in the building. We have a pool, we're trying to get a swim team together. We still have the safe haven that we run during the summertime that's here. Uh, the seniors are here, you know, they're downstairs in the back. Today was Valentine's Day, they all had their red on, having a good time, so they're here. The teen lounge we're doing. We need to do some things like yourselves, some video photography and things. If we think that the basketball gym is gonna bring every kid in here in the boxing gym, we're in the wrong business. They wanna do different things. Everything that they do is on that phone. It's on this. If it's not on that phone, it's not getting done. Well, I think the future, I think the future of the center is just that we will continue to program it and it will continue to grow programmatically. Uh, well, there are still some things we want to do. I just think it will remain a high priority to keep it maintained very well. But I think it, the future of the neighborhood is what's really more important to me. And this is an important foundation for the neighborhood. You know, it's a, it's a great organization to build off of as we try to improve young people's lives, improve the housing stock, improve the condition that our young people are brought up in and in turn reducing violence and the kind of things that you're you're always trying to improve in your city. And we're back. Well, we've just been having a very good conversation to get to understand the formation of J Street. He's done so much in the time that he's been around in the 46 years. He keeps using that number. And I'm very grateful that God has blessed him to be a part of our show today. Uh, we, we were ending off where, you know, there was a struggle, somewhat of a struggle uh, when they were going to name the courthouse, the family courthouse. Tell us a little bit about that. I know you work, work very hard to make sure that um, it, it was named. It wasn't a struggle. It wasn't? Because when I got the phone call that said we're thinking about this, I started cursing and said, y'all <laughs> might be able to pull that off, but you're not going to do it without a fight. Uh, we will demonstrate, we will litigate, we'll do whatever we have to do. And Sam God, to his credit, had yeah. made it crystal clear when the city conveyed that land to the state that mm -hmm. it was to be named the Leonard L. Williams Justice Center. And instead of getting in a big fight about who it wasn't going to be named after, then we proceeded to go on and try to get it named correctly. And Dennis, Mayor Williams and I at, at the time, mm -hmm. Richard Mouse Smith and Sam Guy met with Governor Bar Markell and we asked him to consider naming it because he had the power to do it based on the merits. And he agreed. Okay. It, it, was, it was just that simple. It, it wasn't a matter of a, a fight because when I say I'm on raise my voice <laughs> when I got the phone call people knew I was not playing right and yeah. you can <laughs> try to run down this road if you want you may prevail right right but you're gonna be in a fight you're not ever gonna forget okay and that was the end of that well I, I was so and I wasn't the only person that reacted that way right oh yeah I know I know and as a matter of fact you okay, saw I'm a mouse not, I'm not trying I'm not trying to take credit for it because other people got called yeah and the response, I'll just say, was comparable. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and, and when I heard that, I was very impressed. And then even the people that I'd heard were a part of the response that it ain't gonna happen the way that, that some people may wanted it to happen. I was impressed with it. Many of them are still around. Sam Guy, I heard you mention his name. I heard you mention uh, Mouse and, and others. But yes, that speaks to not being bossed or bought. All too often, how do you feel about, as we are moving through this little conversation, how do you feel about, um, we don't want to say any names, but people who won't take a stand because they've been given a, a couple dollars to shut up and, and, and sell out their community? Well, you know, you made me reflect instantly to the late, great State Representative Hazel D. Plant. Mm -hmm. And I can recall sitting in her living room and her talking about 
these Negroes selling their souls for cheeseburgers. Mm. Um, and she wasn't that far off the mark. Um, and if your priorities is not right and your integrity is not right, mm -hmm. um, you're going to have difficulty functioning in this arena and being any semblance of a change maker. Um, and, you know, my experience as a child, I didn't have sense enough to know that I was a grown man that my parents weren't rich, they just worked hard. Mm -hmm. I was better off, but they weren't rich. Mm -hmm. But because of that experience, I never had any aspirations to be rich. Well, if you're driving a new car when you're 16 years old, you know, <laughs> at age 68 now, a car don't mean nothing to me. Right. When I was 40, I had some, I, you know, I brought this car, this car, this car, well, that's enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I've, I've lived a, a, a good life. I've been able, you know, to, the fact of the matter is, for 46 years, I worked every day and most nights. I paid cash for my older son to go to Morehouse. I paid cash for my, for my younger son to go to Dell State. I ain't asking nobody for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not rich. I'm not, may say I'm a man of means, but I've worked for everything I got. And I'm happy living the way I'm living. It's, it's a mediocre lifestyle, but I've never had any aspirations to be rich. Mm -hmm. And for those who did, well, you know, I feel sorry for them. If that's your priority, mm -hmm. um, you're going to have issues. And I couldn't do this work, right, um, that's right. you know, because the flim flam man is always around. Right. And everybody's got a game and, and everybody's got an angle. And if you do this um, and, you know, I remember taking a grant from a school district. One of our fraternity brothers called me and said, well, you got to slow Devin down. Mm. I said, I got to do what? <laughs> Who are you talking to? Yeah. Um, let me tell you what. Call the superintendent. Tell him don't send me their check. And come get these computers and move these children somewhere else. If you think I'm going to stop Devin from doing yeah. what he's doing, for a raggedy $28,000, you can take that $28,000 and, and praise the uh, Lord. And praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because all, all too often, I, I'm from Philadelphia, and I was bre uh, bred a different way. Um, I wasn't like you who was able to have parents who were very rooted in the NAACP, but I was around ministers who were rooted in the NAACP, who gave me an understanding of responsibility to mankind, not just to my own pocketbook, but to, to, to humanity. So when I, ran, when I came here to Delaware, I was always impressed with brothers like you. When I heard you were a member of Omega Psi Phi, I just got over impressed. Because it wasn't that you were trying to be seen, because there are some people who want to be seen, have no substance. You're not that person. I've watched you fight <coughs> and fight and fight for people. And you made a comment a few seconds ago, and I want to just make sure I, I make sure everybody understood this. You, you, you didn't seek to be rich. You, sit, you, you wanted to live and you, and you had the things that you needed to have as a child. I, get, I got very discouraged whenever there was a real issue and how they were able to be, people were able to be bought. I mean, the governor said to me one time, I'll never forget it, if I got any of the folks from IMAC watching this show, they'll verify this. The governor said, Pastor Curry, of all people, I would not expect you to come after me like this in front of all the I met. And I stopped him and I said, I can never be bought. Because maybe he was used to throwing a couple dollars here and a couple dollars there and people just shutting up. But I come on the tradition, that's why I'm, I'm very much attracted to you as an individual, where you, you speak truth to power. And you stand on it and whatever consequences it happens, it just happened. And that's why we try to live right so we won't have to buckle into. So when you make those comments you made today about, you know, you didn't really seek to be rich. I don't I'm in the same bracket. I just want to make sure that if my people need to be represented, they are represented. So that's that I wanted to grab that out of what you were speaking to today. Well, you know, he wasn't the first one to say it, but I recall the late great Al O'Plant. Mm -hmm being on TV repeatedly on Sunday night saying, if you don't stand for something, you fall for, you fall for anything. Yeah. And 
I'm not gonna fall for anything. Mm -hmm. And you know, you look at if it wasn't for Lou Redden, mm -hmm. I couldn't have gone to the University of Delaware. Okay. He sued and the university had to accept black students, one of which was Lenny Williams. Mm -hmm. Well, my father went to high school at Dell State. I was going to Dell State. My youngest son graduated from Dell State. My, my, my sister graduated from Dell State. I'm on my way to Dell State. But I'm accepted at the University of Delaware, Delaware State, uh, New Haven College in Connecticut, and some uh, school in, in Ohio. Guidance counselor looks at me and says, well, I don't think you should go to the University of Delaware. I why? Well, quite frankly, I, I don't think you could make it down to the mm. University of Delaware. I said, who the f uh, do you think you're talking to? Okay. <laughs> and I called her a whole lot of names, and here come the principal, the old Southern black principal. You can't talk to her like that. No, she can't talk to me like that. Just for that, tell the mothers I'm coming. <laughs> That's the only reason I went down there. Yeah. Well, now we get down there, well, you know, go over to the, to the Greek place, and we're, we're interested in bringing Omega Psi Phi yeah. to the University of Delaware. Yeah. Well, quite frankly, uh, I don't think there'll ever be black Greek letter organization at the University of Delaware under this administration. So really? Okay. You know what? You might be right. But the way I look at it, I got three years. Anybody get in my way, I'm gonna run over starting with you. Mm. Now we go straight to the president. He said, well, I didn't say that. Well, if he said it and you didn't say it, why is he still working here? <laughs> it took all three years. Okay. Um, but we were on a mission. Right. But what did that come from? Okay. My dentist was Woody Wilson. Ah. Okay. Omega Psi Phi. Yeah, yeah. I, I, when yeah. Woody stopped being my dentist, uh -huh. Hammond Knox was my dentist. Okay. So you sitting there in the dentist chair like, what's all this purple and gold? Uh -huh. And manhood, perseverance, scholarship, <laughs> uplift. Um, I believe strongly in those principles. Yeah. I've lived my life by the principles. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when, when uh, my son went over, we came out, he said, Pop. I don't know what that is you gave me, but that ain't the shake. I said, don't worry about the shake. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just remember this. Mm -hmm. You look at it. You look at it. I raised you and your brother. I've run the house, and I ran that center mm -hmm. on the basis of the principle. Oh, yeah. And I believe strongly in the principles, and you'll have a good life to live. You follow those principles. Yes, I, I, I certainly, I'm not going to disagree with you on that because I am very much there. And I, even in my professional life, I was sharing with some of the young people who work with me here at, this, at, at, at the academy that those, those Omega men that have impacted my life, they taught me excellence is the only way. You know, whatever you do, it must be done in a spirit of excellence. And, 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 and the follow-up and the follow-through was very important. So, so I'm, I'm really enjoying the fact that you're able to tie in so many different things that really shaped your life and, 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 and gave you that, you know, we're we going to do it. And, we, and, and I watched the last thing you said about the president or well, somebody in, at the University of Delaware telling you what ain't going to happen. And that's where your fight came from. So when we come back from this break, well, but you know, wait, it, it, hold it, it, it. Wait, before you before you give me that, I want to I want to I want to go to a break and then I want to come back and I want to talk about what causes your fight. But but you can you can say whatever way you want to answer it. We come right back. We'll be right back. And we're back. Listen, I know you was ready to get reared up on the last question, but I, I really want to know what causes the fight. But I already know some of it, what causes you to fight, because when that person told you it ain't going to happen, oh, yes, it is going to happen. But what, 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 what brings up the fight in J Street? Well, number one, my father was stationed in Hawaii for five years during the war. Okay. He was stationed in Hawaii because he taught hand to hand. Mm. Um, so couldn't nobody whoop my father. Mm. And, you know, he taught my brother. My brother, God rest him, knew how to kill people with two fingers and all that old crap. 
And I'm like, Dad, when you boy, who do you think is going to teach? You? No, it's not going to happen. But I was always comfortable in even playing in the street. And people would tell you, well, he couldn't fight. But you weren't going to beat him because, number one, he fight all day. Mm. The fight was never over. And number two, he could make a brick turn a corner. Mm. So that's part of it psychologically and emotionally. And functionally, my mother, one of her models was, when you see a good fight, <laughs> get in it. <laughs> yeah. And be in it to win it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And people don't understand. My mother's in the hospital. I knew she was going to die. She knew she was going to die. Mm -hmm. Congestive heart failure. This is April 2000. April 4th, I would come to the hospital, hand her paper. She opens the paper up. <sighs> State Senate to vote on Neighborhood School Act. She said, what are you going to do about this? I said, Mama, I'm not going to do anything about it today. I'm going to sit here and take care of you. She said, no, you're not. Mm. You're going to go home, and you're going to get dressed, and you're going to go down there, and if you don't do nothing but stand in the back of the room and let them know that somebody's still watching the store, that's what you're going to do, and then you're going to come back here and tell me what happened. Mm. Did what I was told. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was April 4th. She died April 17th. Mm -hmm. As far as I was concerned, she was giving me my marches and orders on her deathbed. Yeah. That's why I never came off the battlefield. Right. Um, and that's why, and this may be my last round, may not be, but I couldn't get any rest mm -hmm. until I could have some comfort and trying to make a difference. And, and I'm never gonna live to see fairness in these schools. And de desegregation will never be a reality. And I said, the best I can do is try to get some money, try to get the re this, uh, additional resources to make it better. It's not gonna make it right, but that hundred million dollars a year mm. is gonna make a difference. Yes, It'll help some of our kids. Um, and then those coming behind me have got to pick it up, continue to battle. How are you feeling about that? Do you feel that there are some coming behind you that you're feeling comfortable with right now? Well, I'm excited about the young people in the General Assembly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we don't always agree. Right. But we, we are agreeing to work together. And some of them are very bright, very talented, very sharp. And, I, I, you know, I look at Namdi. Okay. Um, well... I'm director of Hilltop. Hicks Anderson calls me, says, summertime. Said, you got any openings? I said, no, sir, I'm all four. I've been four. I've been four for a month, Hicks. He said, well, you got three more now. See you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I said, sir, phone click. Next morning, here comes Hicks walking across school, school Springs Park with Namdi, his brother, and his sister. Mm. I said, Hicks, I don't have to. Their mom will bring you the paperwork. See you later. Mm. Um, do what the such and such he says. You act like it's me. From now on, this your Uncle Jack. Mm. Well, fruit don't fall far from a tree. You can't grow up in a house with Hicks Anderson mm. and some of that not rub off on you. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've supported uh, some of the young people and, and um, what I told all of them is I ain't never going to tell you, tell you how to vote. Right. I'm not going to pick up the phone and tell you vote this way, to vote that way. Try. Um, you got to make up your own mind. All right. um, but I'm always here if you just want somebody to talk to or if, or if you want my advice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm trying to do the same thing with them that Lit Mitchell did for me. You know, I can hear it now because I never made a move with the coalition. Mm -hmm. As long as, as Lenny and, and, and Lit were living, I never made a move without calling them. Mm -hmm. And I can hear Lit now, young man, you know better than to try to have this conversation with me. Mm -hmm. 
get down here right now. Now, I got to go to Delaware City. Mm. But he sat there in that river and he gave advice until as long as he lived. Wow. And then who the heck am I to come off the battlefield when we were in Jim Sills' office and we would contemplate whether or not we were going to go in the quarter or, or not. And I don't even remember what it was about. All I remember was I walked in, it was winter time, and I said, Judge, how's Mr. Redden? He said, Mr. Redden, fine. He can't see and he can't hear, but he's fine. So we couldn't agree on whether or not we should go in or not. It was me, Lenny, uh, Irv Morris, mm -hmm. Lou Lucas, and Jim Sills. And I'm grown now, so, you know. Lenny starts putting on his coat. I said, what are you doing? He said, um, I'm on, I'm not sure about this. I'm, I'm going to ask the old man. I said, if you lost your mind, we got a decision to make. You talking about you going to ask the old man. You just said he can't see and he can't hear. What are you doing? He said, he don't need to see to answer my question and he can hear if I holler, shut it up and I will tell you what he said. My point being, Mr. Redden in the nursing home. Yeah. On his back. Yeah. And he made the call, cause Lenny, I, I remember the call that Lenny made to me. We had pages in, but <laughs> wasn't no cell phone. Old man said, go. Okay. He made the final decision on his back in the nursing home. Who am I to quit? Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. You know, what? in a short answer, um, what makes J Street happy? I think the thing that I value the most, of course, is family, mm -hmm. watching my kids grow and develop, having grandkids. But separate and apart from that, when you spend a career working with young people and you had the opportunity to see them grow and develop. What I like the most is when the mentee exceeds the accomplishments and success of the mentor. Okay. So when I got kids who graduated from law school, mm -hmm. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. When I've got somebody who comes in and he's got his PhD, mm -hmm. I'm happy mm -hmm. when I take the young lady who replaced me at Hilltop, her doctorate, um, her dissertation away from uh, having her PhD. Um, I'm happy mm -hmm. when I, I take somebody um, who's got a high school diploma, comes in, works with me as, as a parent coordinator, gets a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. brought me my copy tore it up, said finish it. Mm-hmm. You have it. What do you mean finish it? Get your master's degree. Mm -hmm. You've done this, that, and and now she's running head start for the state of New Jersey. This it's is those awesome. kind, it's those kind of things that mm -hmm. um you know it, it makes you happy. And then Dr. Damon Harris, um, who's a school principal in, in Virginia, comes back to my retirement and he says when I was a kid, the only black man I saw wearing a necktie every day was Mr. Street. And that's why my kids will never see me without wow. a necktie wow. in my school. You are such a model. Let me ask you another question. How I many children? About that. Say, the, you, say, the, say the flowers for my funeral. No, 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 no. I, well, that ain't going to happen because we, we, we won't save the flowers for your funeral. You're going to have a lot of them there. But that's a lot of times people who speak at funerals are the fake, phony folks, but the truth of the matter is you can give them while they're living. Let me ask you this question. Um, how many children do you have, Jay? Two. That's legal. Now, how many? <laughs> so, so you got two. You got, one, you got one who's a Dell State grad. You got one who is a Mohouse grad. Uh, what are they doing? <coughs> Short answers. Jay, <coughs> Jay Jr. is um, a musician. Okay. Um, very talented. 
didn't self taught. Mm -hmm. Didn't I didn't know he had any talent till he went down there to, to Morehouse, um, and then we had to go see the Morehouse Choir at Chester, and they they gave him a little money for a scholarship, and he moved in furniture. Now I'm sitting in the church getting ready to and y'all can take that little fifteen hundred dollar. Why he moving furniture? He ain't the moving man. <laughs> and he put the mic up there, and then he stepped to it. Mm. And he brought the house down. I didn't know to that moment he could sing. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, he, he's doing that, but he's also working part-time in a youth advocacy program of working with kids in fair school. Gotcha. Um, and the youngest, and I could use his words, and when he was a youth worker, he was better working working with kids than I was. I had, <laughs> Reginald Elves, a good friend of mine, who was a roofer, said, I was on the other side of town and these kids was fighting, and I'm up on the roof and they're hollering, Mr. Street, Mr. Street, and I'm looking for y'all. I'm like, well, how are you over here? And it was your son. And I seen your son do something today that good as you and Hicks were back in the day, you couldn't do if your life depended on it. I said, what's that, Reggie? He said, he broke up a fight, he ain't cussing, he ain't touch nobody. You couldn't, oh, yeah. do, you couldn't do that if your <laughs> life depended on it. And I'm like, Jason, you good. You know, Jason stands for Jay's son and Jay Jr. Um, and I'm like, you good at what you do, you need to go in it, pa. Mm -hmm. I can't make no money teaching school, <laughs> okay? I'm gonna major in business and get paid. I'll do that in my part um, volunteer-wise, and that's what he does. Yeah, you know, and, and I was trying to see the trend, and you, and you showed it to me. Both of them are about giving back to the community as well, even though they have been educated in very nice institutions. One is HP, both of them are HBCUs, and I thought that was great. Um, what, and we gotta do short ang answers because we gotta go, What what angers J Street immediately. What will anger him right away? Anytime somebody's treated unfairly, and I'm aware of it, um, that that just bothers me. Um, which is why I react the way I do. It's it's a matter of fundamental fairness, and I don't want to see anybody treated any differently than I want to be treated. I got another question and that, for you. And that's in that you know when I went to uh, Hilltop, my mother told me, everything you learned at the University of Delaware would not help you run that center. Mm. It's one key to being a good administrator mm -hmm. that will help you more than anything else. I said, well, what's that, Ma? You treat people mm. the way you want to be treated, mm -hmm. and you'll be fine. If you don't, you're going to have problems. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. Um, what's, how, how, what's, you retired from um, the Hilltop. You, I heard you made millions at Delaware Park because um, you were working and playing, and between the two, you got rich. What's next for J Street? What's next? Well, the fact of the matter is, I retired from Hilltop as soon as I could when I could draw my Social Security because I did not want the state to be in a position to retaliate against the center yeah. that I spent 35 years building um, in response to the litigation. Well, the litigation is settled now. I'm not worrying about that. Um, so I just became a member of the Hilltop Board of Directors. Okay. Um, I, I want to help Michelle to, to the extent I can um, with, with her journey. Um, not trying to tell anybody what to do, but uh, being a part of that board. Um, I'm going to stay on the battlefield as long as I can, but watching my grandkids at this point grow and glow, that just, you know, that's all that to me, especially when, you know, there's JP, <laughs> JP3 mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there, there's little Jason, and again, that stands for Jason is Jay's son, so. Uh, Jason, <laughs> I got you. I didn't catch it the first time, now I caught it. But let me just say this to you, it was a joy, it was a privilege having you here, Jay. Truly, um, I, I know you as a member of Omega Psi Phi, I know you as a community activist, but you know what? I know you as a child of God. 
Um, Jesus spent a lot of time. I know you like to joke about, you know, you'll cuss everybody. I'll give you some gin. But Jesus spent a lot of time helping the one who was the outcast. That's your mission. We appreciate you. And um, as I've, I've been taught, you don't wait until a person transition to give them their flowers. You give it to them now. So we appreciate you so much. And I hope and trust that the time, go ahead, you wanna say something? I, I cuss and I rare and I do what I have to do. And I can hear an old man talking to my grandfather and I said, Josie, when I hit him, I hit him in God's name. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is my mother did not waste her time making us stay in church all day on Sunday. And I had to do it all. Vacation, Bible school, junior, usher, junior, <coughs> junior choir, and all that. Because I spent a lot of time in the street, mm -hmm. a lot of time on the corner. But when I was on the corner and had to make critical life decisions, mm -hmm. Something in the back of my mind when that boy pulled out that heroin and that needle said, oh, Lord, Jesus, I ain't supposed to be here. And I booked up off that corner and never come back. Good. That's it. Um, and in the absence of a spiritual foundation, I ain't so sure that was the decision I'd have made. Right. Um, which is why I'm going to start bothering all y'all. All this violence out here and all yes. this shooting. Yes. Okay. You want to know what the preacher should be doing? Get them in church. Amen. Get him in Sunday school. Yeah. Get him in vacation Bible school. When the last time you went through town seeing a sign saying vacation Bible school? Yeah. When the last well, time well, you you go past all these churches and say Sunday school at nine forty five and where's that at? Yeah. And well, then you well, want, when, when in the absence of a spiritual foundation, right? No man, no person, and no child is ever made whole. Right. And 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 while we don't do maybe not the vacation Bible, but I agree with you 100 percent. We have to be. And that's why we've changed our whole mission of our church to become a holistic church where we're not just in church on Sunday morning, but we're doing stuff all week long. Brother Jay, thank you so very much for taking time to be with me today. It has been a privilege having him with us. And listen, I'll be right back. Listen, I hope and trust that you had an opportunity to really enjoy our time, our show together today. It was really great and it was wonderful to get an opportunity to get into the psyche and the formation of Brother uh, Jay Street. Um, good man, good man, good man. He fights hard. Um, I love the fact when he talked about the fact that he does not, he did not plan to become rich. One of the problems with some of the leaders in our community is that they want to enrich themselves. But Jay was very clear that he spent his life to help somebody else. And I believe that and I hope that we will stop waiting until a person transition before we start giving them, giving them their flowers. He's a great person, and I hope and trust that you enjoyed. You got some information. For those of you young brothers and sisters who are out there right now, and you really want to fight for justice, you really want to fight for uh, equal opportunities, why don't you try to find a local organization such as the NAACP or one of the other organizations that will be, you'll be able to serve in? Because, listen, if you don't help somebody else, you're going to find that we will be a lost cause. So I really appreciate Jay today. He really giving me a new and renewed spirit of being able to go out and help somebody else. It's been a good show. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will let somebody know to please make sure that you are following us on Instagram, that you're subscribing even to our YouTube channel. All you have to do is go to Ezai and Fair Baptist Church. And I want you to like us on Facebook. This is what we're asking for. Until the next time we get together, I'll see you. <music>